But where are we most compromised as women in Europe or around the world when it comes to women's rights? I honestly feel that we are at war. I mean, I hate the gender mechanism. I really wish we didn't need it. Um, but I think we do need it. There are billions of women passing through similar experiences all around the world. And for whatever reason, we often feel like we're alone. It's time to make a point of discussing these topics from a range of viewpoints. Women in the workplace, fertility, the menopause, women's rights, social media, sexuality, body image, politics, relationships, parenting, age, and women in their role today. These conversations surpass age, race, location. They are relevant to women everywhere. Welcome to The She Word, conversations that women rarely have, but really should. For those willing to change the world one step at a time. For those dreaming of sustainable living. For those striving to find a healthier balance. For those always believing. Browns and Viridian. Love the planet, love yourself. Welcome to the She Word, conversations that women rarely have but really should. And today's conversation is about women and women's rights. And I am here with three incredible powerhouse women who are in the sphere of women's rights and have made this their calling for their lives. So I'm going to just introduce, first of all, Samantha Robedo, who is the founder of the Old Women Foundation, an organization to set up to protect the rights of women and girls around the world to help them thrive. But also, you've been a large part in getting the she word off the ground and making this happen. So I'm thrilled that you're here. Also, Lara Dimitrovic, founding partner partner at Shibris Associates, but also a champion of human rights and the founder of the Women's Rights Foundation here in Malta. And Maria Pisani is a senior lecturer at the University of Malta within the Youth and Community Studies and the Faculty for Social Wellbeing and the co-founder of the Integra Foundation, an organization set up in 2004 to assist with the inclusion of minority groups in Malta. Ladies, thank you so much for being here for such an important conversation. Thank you for being part of the She Word. It's an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Well, as I said, <laughs> as I said, three incredible powerhouse women. And I kind of wanted to start off the conversation and start with you, Sam, just to, as an introduction to what you do and why women's rights has been so relevant in your life. Uh, right. Well, my background um, is uh, sort of education and creative arts. Um, and I ran an educational project in the UK for many years uh, looking at uh, self-esteem and conflict uh, with young people who've been excluded from school. So I've worked in the area of exclusion for a long time and saw the power of communication, of drama uh, in order to better... Uh, better, um, sorry, better facilitate uh, their uh, conversation skills uh, and enable them to get back into school. So it was really powerful looking at group dynamics, looking at disadvantage, and many of the young people that we worked with um, came from very difficult homes mm -hmm. uh, and had sort of been left out from the beginning, had been excluded. So that, uh, that journey uh, took me... At, here to Malta um, and I during the time that I was here we set up the Olwyn Foundation and as you said to protect um, women and girls all around the world but also to uh, help access education which is so important so that educational strand has come through for me and I will go on and on about it actually because I kind of think it's the the core and the key to many of the things that we're going to discuss today and um, this is not just in Malta this is around the world the old this Malta, is around the world yeah so we've worked in in many different African countries um particularly uh, with women in in areas of conflict um women of women international which you may well all know uh 
has a, a program, a training program for women who are affected by conflict in order to enable them to be able to provide for themselves and for their families. Uh, it's like a 12-week training program, which has huge impact on the community. We also do a lot of work in the UK, uh, currently working on a healthy sexual relationship uh, project in schools to open up conversations around what is a good relationship, what is power in a relationship, what does no mean? Looking at consent. This is amazing. Etc. Cetera, et cetera. It is. We have partnered with some extraordinary organisations, and th- our remit is is really quite wide. Um, we do a lot of work as well with domestic violence charities uh, and organisations which were particularly hit um, w- were needed uh, in you know, during COVID. Mm. So the impact there, the increase in women and families needing support was was quite extraordinary mm. yeah i could go on i mean i really could <laughs> we could start talking about female uh, genital mut- mutilation as well but i'll leave that one for now but yeah it's a it's a whole all looking at rights autonomy well you mentioned right there right at the very beginning about inclusion and inclusion in school and inclusion in that program that you had with with young people and of course for you maria that's something that you have been very active in getting inclusion as part of a program of getting getting people included within society here in malta but what's your backstory i mean you're right i i, I think my focus is on inclusion and social justice and i and 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 where I'm at today is part of a journey and I think it's a journey that was shaped by my experience as as a young woman as a, as a girl and as a young woman and also as a migrant a migrant in England and Germany when I lived there as a child and also a migrant or a returned migrant um, in Malta um, where I came at the age of 16 and and struggled I think well not I think I know struggled um, with societal expectations as, as a young woman at that time coming from a very different culture especially in those days um, but then I I think I started to take more of a dive in because I think for a, m- a number of years I tried to because inclusion is a funny word isn't it um, included into what and and do I want to, you know, I was thinking uh, as, I was, as, as I was driving here, I was thinking about the feminist movement and, 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 and what it is that we're looking for. And I, I, I remember last, I think last spring, it could have been Women's Day, I can't even remember exactly, but the, the idea of a pedestal came to mind. Um, and and what, what does it mean to be a feminist? And, and, and I like the idea of creating the space for me, feminism is creating the space for all human beings to be respected equally um, with dignity and to be able to stand on their own pedestal. So in, in creating a space where I can stand on my own pedestal. And I think for a few years, I tried really hard to be included, which meant standing on somebody else's pedestal. The, the problem with that is you can easily be pulled down once you don't meet those expectations. And for a while I struggled with, with that. But then I went to university as a mature student. So I left school at 16. And then I went to university. I, um, I already had three children by then. And my degree, my master's, my PhD, all focused on different aspects of young women's lives from belonging, I would say, and, and what it means to belong in multi-society as an adolescent, as a female adolescent, um, to forced migration and, and the particular experiences of young women as they make the journey across the Mediterranean Sea and how gender impacts on that journey. Um, and then looking at in adult education and the needs and experiences of women, female asylum seekers, in terms of their learning needs and and creating space for transformation in in their own lives um, in terms so so that has sort of been my journey I'd say over the last few years I've shifted a little bit so at the beginning where I looked more at the experiences of women as if they this sort of notion of sisterhood and, and women all were experiencing the same thing. Today, my ideas have shifted ever so slightly, and I and I like to I try to look at the different vectors of power in society and how they impact different individuals' lives, including the lives of women. So, looking at patriarchy, looking at racism, looking at socioeconomic status, and how these impact particularly young women's lives in different times and in different spaces. 
We already have about 15 shows that have just come out of those two, <laughs> <laughs> those two conversations already. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, I'll slow but that down. It was down. really interesting, and I immediately want to get in but I won't, but I really want, immediately want to Laura, ask you a question. Laura, have, you also have an extraordinary story. So what's your background, and how is women and women's rights particularly relevant to you? Do you want the short version or the long version? <laughs> well, I mean, you could follow Maria's example. We could no, go on no. for a half a day. Um, well, I would say that I have always been, in a way, a ribbon. Okay, so I was always um, angry and sort of like, but angry at any injustice that took place. And I think sort of in a way this started forming, particularly in my um, post-secondary um, years, in my sixth form years. Um, and remember, you know, we had crew sort of done a whole protest and you know, without any permits, you know, today it would even cross my mind to go and protest without a permit. Uh, so sort of like these impromptu, you know, blocking streets and blocking traffic. And so sort of like that was always there in me. Um, and I was really, you know, back then it was just a matter of fighting for education, um, just, for, just for our education and rights. And kind of this shifted. I would then became a young mother. Uh, I had my first son when I was 18 years. So sort of that again started changing, you know, then this better understanding of, of, you know, women and motherhood. Still at a very young age, I could see, you know, that this constant forcing of having to breastfeed when I could not breastfeed, you know, making me feel like I'm, you know, sort of less of a mother, let's put it this way. Um, Skip also went to university as a mature student, had two kids by then. And again, I started seeing, you know, different ch- things. I, I went into law. I am a lawyer. Um, so obviously, you know, you start learning about rights um, and justice and social justice, you know, so sort of kind of that started forming me a bit more. Went into work with migrants. So I used to work in detention centers and I particularly only wanted to work with women and children. You know, I sort of felt that I could give them more because of their own vulnerability and it just kind of blew my mind in a way. I learned so much from these women. Their hardship, their stories, their trauma, and yet, I mean, honestly, look, I get goosebumps, yeah, goosebumps. every time, I think. Um, their, their, you know, their power, their, their energy, their, their, you know, constant strive. Um, I'm pushing on, it, it's incredible. So anyhow, did that, finished my law degree. And finally, you know, went into court, started up my private practice. Uh, I wanted to do this completely on my own. And the first thing I do once I walk in a courtroom, apart from being sexually harassed by my colleagues, uh, <laughs> I just started realizing that this is really big injustice. So after six years, you know, of studying and wanting, you know, this is the justice. And now I'm going to go into court of law and I'm going to bring justice. Women, oh my goodness, they were suffering, particularly in the area of um, domestic violence. And so then that's what led to me now setting up the foundation, Women's Rights Foundation, um, and just have been soldiering on on and on. I mean, from domestic abuse to, we mentioned, if, you know, FGM is another area, and human trafficking and rape. And of course, I mean, last not but least, um, sexual and reproductive rights, I mean, which is absolutely <laughs> negligible, I would say. Um, yeah. Well, let's, let's start with this as a foundation, because one of the statistics that I'm going to share today and the most frightening statistic is that the current rate, it will take 136 years for women to be on an equal footing with men with regards to social acceptance, rights and how women are seen within society. So I think I want to start with a real basic question because it touches on everything that you guys have just said. But why? Why are we sitting at this table talking about women's rights when surely it should be in 2022 accepted that we have the same rights? Well, yes, it should. But and it's obviously not. And I was looking up because I knew that we were obviously going to have this, you know, talk about this specific um, question. And I was thinking, why? And I started really looking up why, like literally, why are women you know, treated? Why are we considered subservient? Why are we even talking about it? I even thought the title of the, of the um, you know, this podcast was like women's rights. Why do we have to have this conversation? And unfortunately we do. And unfortunately that statistic is very scary. 136 years. That's not in my lifetime, my children's lifetime, my grandchildren's lifetime, you know, their children, etc. Um, and that's, that's really alarming. Um, and why? I think it's because we are considered to be subservient in some form, that we live in a patriarchal society, we always have done, and that hasn't changed. 
there are changes, of course, we can vote all of the things that you know our, our predecessors have fought for, but all of those things had to be fought for. They were just not naturally, they were not naturally given. And yes, I would say patriarchy and misogyny, that is mm. why, you know, um, something that has been left to permeate and still, you know, exists. And it's so real, you know, and it's, it's, I would say, more alive in some societies than another. It's alive in certain aspects more than, rather than others. Um, but that is exactly what it is. And if, if you look back in history and even the feminist movement history, I mean, it's only been in the last, I would say, 60 years or so, no, from the 1960s. Um, did I get that right? I'm, my goodness, my math is terrible, but anyhow, but from the 1960s, <laughs> uh, perhaps just a little bit before, that actually women started vociferously standing up. You know, even if you look at the first wave of feminism, if you look okay, at the suffragette the movement, yes, yes. Um, it was again the privileged women to a certain extent that stood up and, and you know, fought for voting rights and property rights. Um, but it was only then back, so it's been a very short span of time, and hence why that figure, and I would say, to be honest, I would say it t- will take a longer period than 136 years. That's the very optimistic one. <laughs> um, but but that's, that's the reason why, you know. But I, I think if you look at it on paper, it, I think we, we need to be, uh, sort of unpack the nuance. On paper, there is equality in terms of rights, the, the question is, are women accessing those rights? And if not, why not? Um, just, and, and even just using the term patriarchy, I think it's quite a complex term and, and, and many people won't even understand what, what we mean by that. If we just yesterday, and I, I can't tell you the positions that they held, I, I can't remember, because to be honest, I opened a website and... and um, I got really angry in, 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 in a very short amount of time, posted on Facebook and, 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 um, and didn't read it again. I read it once and didn't read it again. Just yesterday, I think three new commissioners, three or four new commissioners were appointed. Yes, three new commissioners. And yeah, obviously you have all commissioners all. of water being men. All men. And, and all not, men. Not all. just that they are men, they are elderly men. So they are older you know, men, as yeah. this, you know. All, you know and and yeah. this is... And, that this is now I've got goosebumps you know what is it going to take for these cultural norms because people don't bit bat an eyelid because it's so normal isn't it you don't you know you see a man in power uh, and it's, it's not because I have any objection to men in power that they need to be represented it's the fact that there isn't representation when it comes to other genders today we're focusing specifically on women but of course it's not just women and different ages yeah. and different social and social cultural groups different ethnicities if I go into a space with my lens, I, I always say to my students, it's like I've put on a pair of glasses. If I'm, if I'm wearing my glasses, which are gendered, I am a multi-citizen, I am a mother, that is how I'm going to read the world, through my lens. If everybody in that group, if all people in, in power in Malta are looking through the world and understanding the world with the same lens, then they are not going to understand the needs and perspectives of people who do not have the same lens, the same experience, the same needs. And this is how patriarchy continues. It's complex. Well, you've just hit the nail on the head, and I'm just going to jump in with a statistic that comes right back at that, because in Malta, in this country, 91.7% of the legal frameworks that promote, enforce, and monitor gender equality with a focus on violence against women are in place. So how have we ended up where we are? If the, if the framework is there, how is it that we're still having these issues? How is it that we're still having all male commissioners? And that is why I would say that even the laws need to... Our laws are still not reflective of equality. Because no, my I'm something. not saying okay. work needs to... No, uh, and I think that is done. why we further need the laws to ensure that there is equality. However, that in its own Isn't enough. is not enough. And this is something that I believe is 
constantly happening. I mean, at least it's my observation, you know, it's becoming endemic of, of Modi's society of, of you, know, you know, putting a rubber stamp saying, hey, yeah, we take the framework, we've got the legislation, but without any form of implementation, serious implementation towards that legislation Meaningful implementation um you you end up you know pretty much in the same position in the same situation just simply ticking a box and looking good on paper um but i would say that despite the fact particularly in the area of violence against women despite the fact that we have implemented you know international treaties specifically dealing with violence against women i would say that attitudes and even um the structure system of supporting women in, vi- um, in situations in of violence in not just institutions but across the board let's say you know let's say institutions um has regressed so how can that be if we better up legislation, um, but yet the attitudes and the support has regressed? It's incredible, isn't it? Because we've just ticked the box, but there's no because there's no, Because there's no education that's going... You're saying, yes, it's a tick the box. And then yeah. there's, no, there's no... I would. I mean, I, I don't know, but is there training that goes along with that? You're changing this, you know, yes, this attitude. Is it the training, training that we're ticking the box? Again, we, so we're ticking the box of the training. X amount so of like training, mouth you know? service to lip Not service. In, exactly, exactly. Rather than really wanting to see yeah. change. No, no, exactly. So, so this is, I think, yeah. But when we're talking about education, I think we need to unpack what we mean by that as well. Because if you look at the majority of graduates in Malta, for example, they're women. So access to education, having an education isn't enough. Um, So I think we need to, what do we mean when we're talking about education as well? And how does learning, or perhaps perhaps not learning, unlearning um, some of the cultural norms and traditions that we take for granted? In Malta, as of uh, February 2020, and we have seen some changes, and I'm going to come to that in a second, but only 13.4% of the seats in Parliament were held by women. Now, then we had, obviously, you had the election, and we saw that the women were not voted in position, but that quota that was needed was then filled by elected women. Is that the way to go? Is that what we do? Is, that, is this how we force the, the women's equality? And that's, I think, kind of this ties a little bit with what I was saying before, that sometimes, yes, you need the legislation because you need um, temporary measures, and that would be a very temporary measure, to kickstart a change in mental, in, in um, societal, you know, mentality, in attitudes. However, just by merely changing the legislation is not enough. You know, more has to be done. So that legislation without other, you know, family friendly measures, let's say in in parliament hours, um, you know, care centers will not push enough women to be interested, you know, into coming forward into the political world. And even then, if you look at the society, you know, with the voting, um, not many voted for women. Okay. You still had the majority that would go for May. So again, what does this say, going back to education? You need to change that perspective as well, that women are capable. And, you know, really commit yourself, because I know part of the discourse was, oh, but look, the women are going to come up just the same, so I don't need to vote for them. Um, then I think it was also, you know, incumbent upon the political parties themselves and the politicians to push their own women, say, no, you need to vote for them, you know, kind of to move by way of example, you know, and not just have the clause and just, you know, leave it there. I think that's my, the way I see it. I mean, I hate the gender mechanism. I really wish we didn't need it. Um, but I think we do need it. And I, I recall um, very recently our most successful politician, perhaps, um, in terms of climbing the ladder and uh, is Roberta Metzler. And I recall somebody saying, um, you see, she didn't need the gender mechanism. But actually, Roberta went up for election, I believe, twice and was not elected. She came into, she took the seat of Simon, I think, once Simon vacated it. The, um, otherwise, she, so even Roberta needed that 
extra support to be able to access the political realm um, then yes then once she was in she was able to to demonstrate that she was more than qualified um, to, to, to hold that position and 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 do a good job with it but we need these yes. mechanisms nothing has changed because we're saying that if women are in positions of power then they have the opportunity to push forward women's rights and women's equality and make things more equal for women i assume i assume that's what we're saying because if you look at this globally we've just lost one of the most powerful figures of the recent time whether you liked her or not the queen has just passed away and had the longest uh, legacy of monarchy in the in Britain. So as a small child, as a girl, as a for the for generations, you wake you're growing up with mm -hmm. a role model role yeah. model of being queen. And of course, in the UK, as Sam and I are both from the UK, we also have had Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher. We've had very positive and female role models. Does that mean? that there are no issues in the UK when it comes to women's rights because there are people in power. How does this, because you, you've got no, a right smile yeah, on your no, face. No, I mean, it's wonderful. I just, I think, I think that, um, you know, Liz Trust coming in now, that we, we bring women in, we vote, well, Liz, obviously, well, she wasn't voted in, but we bring women in when we need things cleared up. That is exactly, that's what happened with Thatcher. That's, you know, and that's exactly what's happened with Liz Truss. I, well, we won't go down the line of whether I think she's going to be in power for very long. And I think it is very, I think it's very interesting. I think to a certain extent, those three female prime ministers were masculinized in some sense, if that is a word, that there's a, there was a certain... Well, there's a certain mockery and uh, all sorts of... The job comes with, obviously, all sorts of difficulties. But then I think that it's very difficult to be a woman in power in uh, in the UK. I think that, obviously, the Queen, she was like our matriarch. You know, everybody adored her, whether you were a royalist or you're not. Um, there was It was like being in a safe pair of hands, despite the historical colonisation, etc., etc., and all of the other issues that... Um, were somehow held at bay because she held it. And I think that's really interesting. There's, there's such a, a, a sense of safety in matriarch um, that the idea of rocking that role uh, creates a lot of unease. And I think what you were saying about the role model, you know, role modeling, I mean, I, I agree. I don't um, think that we should be pushing the agenda where we have to place women in government but I think it's really important that young girls and young women see women in politics and see women in power and see women leading and at the moment if we don't help to put them there you, you mentioned something and sort of like how um, women leaders you know like Liz Truss and um, Theresa May I think was another yeah. one known that they come sort of they're brought in to clean up um, but also the attitudes and the comments that people make towards um, empowered women mm -hmm. okay so I'm not just taking the politicians but I myself and I'm sure all of us here at the table have received a couple of comments or two um, and kind of you see which men wouldn't and I you know as while saying this I was also thinking of the Finnish prime minister for example mm -hmm. you know the whole Marriage, oh, yes. the recent yeah, yeah, yeah. one, the recent yeah. one just yes. simply yes, because yes. in her free time, yeah. you know, she, whereas, you know, I, I think, would a man have got the same, you know, would she have had to go out in public, you know, and cry to convince the public, you know, go through the humiliation of having to do a drug test to prove to the public that um, she did not do drugs and she was simply enjoying herself, you know, in a very private place. Um, so I, I really... And this is why, this is why we need women's rights. This mm -hmm. is why we have to continue to fight for women's rights. And this is why we need to continue for those 136 years, you know, to somehow reach equality. Because it's these attitudes, you know, in, irrespective of what strat and what level of society you are at, you know, it, it's, it's constantly there. But, but I, I want to sort of, I, I had very little time for Margaret Thatcher, probably possibly a little bit more but not much more for Theresa May yeah. so just because a woman's in power doesn't mean that I will vote for her mm -hmm. or that I like her policies I'm, I'm not about to celebrate somebody just because they're a woman 
absolutely I, I, not. I, you know, I, 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 but it doesn't take away for. But I don't celebrate every male politician, mm. and I certainly don't like every male politician, and I don't stand. I don't have much time for Boris either. No. Um, no. So, but but I think that's the point. We still need representation mm-hmm. and different perspectives, and 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 I may or may not like them. No, of course, most definitely. I mean, may or may not like them. But again, as we're saying, because you mentioned the commission is now all being male. I mean, if, if a woman comes forward with a, with a human rights complaint and goes forward to the commissioner, you know, and just purely based on women's issues, you know, will he really actually understand, understand it? And as you're saying, you know, go back to the glasses that the he's lens. wearing and perceiving. And I'm hoping that again, with the, yes, not my favorite, but at least a much needed clause of um, like the gender quota. Um, and may, any other measures really um, would bring, you know, listen, discourse of a female perspective, you know, female's journey. And I'm sure that it's not easy for politicians or for women in power, uh, well, women in power, <laughs> women in, let's say, in, in, in higher positions, oh, 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 um, to, to actually, you know, kind of push that and, and convince, or not convince, at least to relay um, to the male counter parties. New Black Stack Mascara. People in persons in power who are women are able to see women's issues, women's rights, women's challenges with a pair of glasses that are uh, and lenses that are focused on the the issue from a women's point of view. Obviously, we can see why women in power are important. But I have to say, when we talk about women's rights and we talk about you know, gender rights and, and human rights, we tend to think about every other country except the country that we're in. We tend to think it's a sort of a not a European issue because we're modern and we're, you know, we're, we're progressive. And of course, that statistic says absolutely we're not. But where are we most compromised as women in Europe in Malta or around the world when it comes to women's rights? Is it just because, you know, we not don't have representation in parliament or is it, where is we as women who are listening to this podcast, where are we being most compromised? I would say autonomy over our own bodies was, would be where we are most compromised. And we are, it is not so different in Europe, in some countries in Europe, as it is to you know, countries in, in in Africa. Explain that. What do you, what, break that apart for me. What are we talking about? Well, I believe that we have the right over our own body to do with it as we please. Uh, and I think, you know, from the FTM sort of conversation, which is not um, specific to African countries, we know that it's medicalized and it's in Europe FTM. as well. FTM. Female genital mutilation or FGC, female, female genital cutting. Um which is at a, a point where, and it can happen as early as a, you know, age five for a girl, um, where the right to your own body is taken away from you because somebody has cuts you and takes a part of your body away before you even understand that you have autonomy or that you have rights over your own body. So that's something that I'm working very hard to but eradicate is, but it's a very is. complicated well it is it's in it's you know it's in africa it's and we'd all associate it with you know tribal custom but it's actually medicalized in europe and doctors are practicing it um i mean it's illegal well it's illegal in the uk i presume it would be illegal here too um so this to me it is essential that we have the right over our own bodies and we know that the pro-choice debate, etc., cetera, um, and the sad overturning of Roe versus Wade. I've even heard of two women who, in the UK who've been um, imprisoned for late abortions, which I just thought was absolutely staggering. Because you know, I think, oh, we're, you know, we're so advanced, like you're saying, we're so modern, we're so, you know, we would never do that. And it seems that those particular cases... Those women are victims of domestic 
abuse. So it is, it is so complicated uh, and really tragic. So for me, that is the most pressing. For me, I think it's very important and I have been very clear in terms of my position on abortion. Um, I'm pro-choice, but I would say it depends. It depends on the individual, where they're at, um, and that is often related to where they are geographically, um, not just globally, but also uh, within a nation state, um, soci socially, where they're at economically. Um, so I would say it depends. And, and I would agree that bodily autonomy is one of those issues, but I wouldn't say it's the issue. I'd say it depends. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. FG FGM or, or female genital cutting is a particularly interesting one for me. Um, and I think this is where my ideas started to change. I actually published a paper specifically on this issue because it was one of the first legislations that we introduced in Malta um, was um, on, on FGM um, to stop. FGM, and I, and I want to be clear, um, FGM uh, is, is um, generally um, in the main, 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 um, done against the consent of the woman or the child. In the case of a child, she doesn't. I mean, there's no way there can be consent if we're talking about a five-year-old. And very, very often, it is a child. There is no consent. And often it's done under really awful and awful conditions as well, and dangerous conditions. And sometimes it's done in a top clinic. Mm -hmm. But one of the first times um, when I was working, it was in the beginning. It was around 2008. So it wasn't that early on. And one of the first conversations that I had with a group of women from Somalia. Um, and Somalia FGM is, is, is practice and they specifically came to speak to me about it wasn't so much FGM but what was happening to them in the hospital and they actually fixed a meeting with me um, to discuss it they were very very concerned and, it, and it, for me it was fascinating they told me that they were told that um, cutting would protect them through life and so they cut their daughters too that this was a now they they went through horrible journeys Lara, Lara touched on it earlier on um, the violence that men and women are exposed to um, in the journey to Malta but particularly women where rape is normalized is awful and they would have witnessed this violence and experienced this violence and they said to me we know today that it doesn't protect us um, that did not protect us we were as exposed as 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 as, as everybody um, to rape but when they were going in to deliver babies in the hospital in Malta and I understand of course at the beginning especially um, that um, the, the, the doctors and the midwives in Malta, they'd never seen something like this before. It's not a, pr a practice that was um, uh, today. It's different, of course. Many years later, they're, they're much more exposure. But in those days, they didn't know how. And they were, um, the, after delivery, they were essentially reconstructing these women's vaginas. And the women had a real issue with it. They were saying, look, this is, I, I don't want it to be closed up. I, my ideas have changed, but I want my vagina to look like what it always looked like. Don't fix it when I didn't ask you to fix it. So I think even there, we yes. need to be really, really careful when we talk about bodily autonomy and what we think needs to be fixed and what we think. So it still comes down to choice for me, and I stress a child cannot make that choice and a woman should never be forced to but but today we also have designer vaginas you can go into still, a clinic and still get a sparkly vagina if mm -hmm, you want one mm -hmm. so we don't have an issue with changing our vagina it's who decides is the issue yeah and that's bodily autonomy isn't that's it? bodily I mean, autonomy if you want a sparkly that's vagina bodily you can have yeah, one yeah absolutely and it's the want, issue of you choice know, having gone through that but i would say it depends whether or not how important that is to you depends on where you're at if you can't put food on your table then you're not really concerned about bodily autonomy you're more concerned about feeding your kids for example i'm not saying it's not important i'm just saying that that takes priority it's not but it's an and yeah Laura, I'm what? loving the sparkling vagina. <laughs> <laughs> a so, 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 <laughs> Laura, what do you see, apart from sparkling vaginas, being the most important and the most 
challenging issues when it comes to women's rights? I would say, yes, autonomy. Um, and in fact, even if you look back at what's happening at to very just very recently, okay, um, that's the first thing that those are the first rights that are taken away from women. So if you look at Poland, you look into Hungary, because now they've got new legislation in Hungary. If you look at um, other countries like I can't think at the moment, but you know, you, these are the first issues. Croatia, for example, case in point, um, Italy with the conscientious objection. So these are generally um, the first rights that women have, either don't have or are taken away from them. Roe versus Wade, case in point. Okay? And I always say, for me, I don't know what it is like to have a choice when it comes to accessing abortion care, of course, um, because we don't have it. We have a total ban. But I cannot begin to imagine what it must be like for a woman, for a woman to have had that right and be taken away. Taken away. It again, sorry, I get goosebumps, goosebumps on this mm -hmm. one. Okay, something that women have fought and strived and managed to obtain, and then it's gone. So yes, bodily autonomy, I would say. But of course, then you have the issue of violence against women, which I feel very strongly about. The issue of what? Violence against women. Okay. Um, and, and again, I mean, it, it's, it's not good enough that we are creating, and, and we needed international treaties. We had the Council of Europe, we had the United Nations that actually created treaties specifically dealing with violence against women and girls. And, you know, again, we come back to the lip service and ticking and yes, we're implementing the legislation, but we're not changing the attitudes and we still have a very tolerant attitude, especially when it comes to rape. I mean, if you just look at the comments on social media, it's always appalling. It's absolutely appalling how you have so much victim blaming, constant secondary victimization, you know, constantly doubting even headlines you know, just of newspapers. Um, I, I, it kills me when I see man had sex with girl. Excuse me? That's rape. <laughs> there was no sex. <laughs> Full stop, you know? So, so yeah. So, for me, these are the two main issues. And I think that and for, they go very much hand in hand. I cannot separate the two issues. And if, you know, we have to continue to They're fight entangled. for those two issues. They are. Yeah. They are. Um, and, and I think, yeah, that this is who I am and where I am. And this is what I will continue to fight for. Because if we manage to at least break some barriers there, we might be then getting to... 120 years rather than 100. How do we break those barriers against? Uh, let's go back to violence for a second. Yeah. We've we talked about autonomy of your body and we've we've discussed that. But coming back to the violence, which is the second part of that, which as we've said is intrinsically connected to uh, to autonomy. How do we change that? Because this is this hasn't changed for millennia. We're in 2022 and talking about the fact that violence against women still occurs and is still made to be superficial or small or irrelevant how, how do we change or non-existent or yeah. it's made up or, <laughs> so or hidden other. behind yes. yeah closed um, curtains yeah. It, yeah. it cannot be done on its own a legislation cannot be just sit there and put you know leave it there in vacuum you really need serious prevention um and education mm -hmm. and awareness raising um you know in order to change and bring a cultural shift and this but for me it has to be constant political commitment you know I always go to the top you know it has to work top down okay and bottom up and the other way around but there has to be serious commitment from the top because if there isn't that commitment from the top then it's not it's not going to change and again I go back see what's happening we're seeing now a rise in far-right ideology. And we know this, this is documented, okay? We're seeing how um, you have oligarchs that are funding billions of money into even uh, political parties for them to get into power. And that's where we're seeing the shift of legislation. And what's the first thing that they would attack? Women's rights and minority rights, LGBTI rights. And we're seeing this. It's happening constantly it's happening around globally. us. So, you know, there's this constant war. So if we want to now change, if we want to stop that war, there has to be that political commitment. Because otherwise, you know, there has to be some empathy, you know, of, of wanting to bring that. Because honestly, at, at this point in time, yes, I've just come back from a very lovely holiday and I feel very rested. But I don't think, I, I mean, I honestly feel that we are... In, at war. That's how I feel at the moment, that we're at war. Women are. Um, yeah.
Are we at war? You agree? We're at war? It's so huge. That's what I feel. It's so huge. And there are so many layers. Um, and I think it's a very scary time. I think it's a very scary time for women. And I think it's a very scary time for the climate. Um, and I think that we need to, um, that our education system needs to evolve um, to have a more holistic approach to look at communication, to look at relationships, to understand power and dynamics. Um, so yes, yeah, we are. We're on high alert. I, I would, I, I share, and I really feel. Um, I, I, re I really feel you um, and, I, and your frustration. I think I come um, at disappointment and fear. Um, and um, many of the issues that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, I think we said before we started, I think they've gone backwards as, as well. And it is so easy to go backwards. It is so easy. And, and I think now I've got goosebumps again. You see, when you when you enjoy something and you've enjoyed it all your life, it becomes normalized. You don't see how, you know, many young people, many young women don't see, they're standing on the shoulders of other women that have fought for them. Not just women, even men, you know, there are, you know, I mean, we, we've all, we, we're able to, to, to come together around this table because somebody fought for us to be able to do that. But if this is all you know, then you, don't know how how it needs to be protected um i don't always i'm, I'm not just looking at women um I, I i look at because of my work on race issues and and migrant issues um I, there are certain rights that we can enjoy um that that they are denied on a on a day to day basis and and i i I've, I've spoken to you, I think, as, as well, about I really have struggled with it. And burnout is so, uh, is so you know, because it, you become so disillusioned um, by the violence in all forms that some people face on a daily basis in order to be able to survive, in order to be able to survive. And, 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 I, and there seems to be not a little awareness or little interest or perhaps what worries me the most is the lack of empathy that's what keeps me up at night the lack of empathy um the the ability to 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 put yourself in somebody else's shoes and say shit that's tough that's, that's and that's not okay. And the first thing I say to my students, and we're going to go back to, to, to another semester, and the first thing I say to them is, what do you stand for? And I'm not, it's not my job to tell them what to stand for, but it is, I think, my job to facilitate a space where they have to think about what they stand for. Because if you stand for nothing, then you'll fall for anything. And we're falling. Oh, yes. We're falling. Oh, yes. And that is, that is scary. That is key. Okay, so ladies, we, to sort of pull this towards a, an end, I'm going to ask each of you, you are powerhouses. You are women who are ready to stand up and to work for women's rights and to fight for women's rights and to fight for a better life for women, not just in Malta, not just in the UK, but all around the world. But what can every woman do? to make a difference because you talked also about violence and and the 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 statistics show that domestic violence is on an increase it has been on an increase over the last three or four years so this is probably going to be affecting an awful lot of women and it's not just physical violence it can also be uh, abuse verbal abuse mental abuse all these sorts of things I don't think there are many women these days who have not been touched either personally or by someone close to them has experienced this and of course that's your point of reference for, for women's rights, is that we want to eliminate that. We also talked about autonomy over your own body. What can each woman do, every woman do, to make a difference? Because 136 years is not soon enough. And we're talking also about it going backwards, in, our women's rights going backwards in so many areas. For you, Laura, what can every woman do? 
I think it's do not be tolerant. And of course, I'm not talking about women experiencing a violent situation because, you know, once you're in it, it's not easy to get out of it. But at least for the women around, um, for us that might be aware, is do not tolerate, do not, um, how should I put, do, do not uh, kind of, you know, like shy away from that reality. This is a reality, you know, and we need women to stand up for women. We need to stand up for, for, for one another. We need to unite. Um, we're all affected. I mean, some more than others, some, you know, with different reasons. Some might be more privileged than others, but it doesn't mean that because I'm more privileged, I, you know, don't particularly care about the underprivileged. And I think that there has to be more unity. For me, this is, it, it's crucial. And we're seeing it, you know, we're seeing that, that solidarity, that support. So, yeah, that's what it is for me. Maria? Where you see injustice, call it out. And you can do that in different ways. There are many different ways of calling it out, but take a stand. So I'm going to call you out for an example of what a woman can do. If she's seeing injustice, what does she do? It, it, it can be anything. It, it can be from you know making a phone call to, to a local politician, to making a phone call to the police, or turning up on someone's doorstep and saying, I'm here for you. There are different ways. You, and, and, I'm, and I'm certainly not going to say this is the way you should do it, because I think we can all find our own ways. Um, and sometimes it's, the, it's the, the, the invisible work that is the most powerful work that really makes a difference. So, you know, we all have a role to play and those roles are different recognize it see it call it out and do your little bit Jeff? well I completely agree of course with both of you it reverberates really strongly um, with me and I think uh, just to pick up from both what what you, uh, you were both saying is is to support so to stand in solidarity and to support and do the because sometimes it is so overwhelming it feels like we can't do anything because it's so big and to realize that one if you can affect change in one person's life one woman's life then the ripple effect of that perhaps on her family or on her community will you know be it be potentially you know, in, enormous and I think we really need to, to to stand up to call it out and to support and really go out of our way to support because we can all do it and it doesn't have to be monetary. And I think that's really No, there important. are different ways. Time, yeah. time, empathy. A hug. A hug, precisely. <laughs> you know. And sometimes it's just a comment. I mean, social media is so powerful in this society, you know. It's just a comment. That's all it takes. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you for doing what you do and for being the powerhouses that you are. And thank you also for giving that hint and that advice to all of us to start making change it's been really lovely being here it has been yeah, yeah. it has <laughs> it's been really lovely it's been heavy it's been but a great yeah. conversation yeah. though yeah thank i've you learned a lot indeed. thank you it's been super cool and we are done actually We're but done. thank you very Good. much indeed Thanks. thank you my morning starts here with an experience that's unforgettable a precise roast and a generous crema taste the unforgettable espresso